Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel, welcoming you to this special edition of Movies That Pop, the films of Pixar Animation Studios, ranked from worst to best. Pixar has probably the greatest track record of any studio today, meaning they haven't made, strictly speaking, a bad film. Even the worst film on their roster was still what I'd consider a medium bag of popcorn, a mild recommendation. No other studio, not even Walt Disney Feature Animation themselves, is as consistent at creating indelible, lovable characters and delivering emotional sucker punches amongst the laughs, goosebumps, and cheers in their rich, rich stories. And here on this very weekend, which sees another release aimed towards children, the insufferable-looking secret life of pets. Seriously, if I have to see that damn poodle headbanging one more time, it was mildly amusing the first time, but this trailer has literally been attached to everything I've seen over the last few months, and the 15th time I saw it, I contemplated homicide! Anyway, rather than waste my time looking at that pandering tripe, I'm gonna focus this week on the people that do family entertainment right, and just list the films of Pixar from worst to best. Because, to paraphrase one of Pixar's unforgettable characters, if you are what you eat, I only want to eat the good stuff. Now, Pixar Animation has made 17 films, so we don't have a lot of time to devote to discussing each and every one of them, so I'm just gonna hit you right away, and we're gonna get off and running. Are you ready? Here we go! Number 17 is Cars 2. This one took the weird concept of the first film, a world with all cars and no humans, and made it more complex by switching genres to a spy movie. Still set in a world with no humans, but raising too many new questions. So, they have guns? Who makes the guns? How do the cars reload them without any hands? However, it's just mild and inoffensive, and if this is Pixar's worst film, it's still more fun than, say, home. Number 16 is A Bug's Life, and it's a basic, well-constructed, inoffensive film for children with a few laughs. It also makes for a fun land over at Disney's California Adventure theme park, but there's not really much else to say about this movie. Most other studios in Hollywood are only making movies at about this level here. It's just sort of basic for Pixar. Number 15 is The Good Dinosaur. This is modern Pixar, and as a result, it is breathtakingly beautiful. It's also very slight, barely has a story, and gets by merely on its cuteness. Despite all of this, they still squeezed tears out of me. Number 14 is Monsters University, a prequel to Monsters, Inc., which had a lot of fun with its concept, but doesn't have a whole lot of rewatchability potential. Still, the world it created was richly detailed and fun to behold, even if it didn't fascinate me as much as Monsters, Inc. when we saw it for the first time. Number 13 is Brave, and it's perhaps the scariest of the Pixar films. This is the first film on the list that really took chances and had them pay off, although not as successfully as something truly envelope-pushing as Inside Out. But a headstrong young girl whose act of rebellion accidentally turns her own mother into a bear, and who must break the spell before her bear-hating father accidentally murders his own wife? This coupled with the very first instance of nudity in a Pixar film and the demon bear of Mordu make this film less suitable for the very, very young, but for more mature kids and adults, it was a daring treat. Hmm, treat. Makes me want one of those tarts. <gasps> Number 12 is Cars. Look, sure, this one had a great time with the visual puns, and we got a deep roster of new fun characters. Even Mater was fun the first time around, but I just had too many questions. So, a world with no humans, just cars, and who makes the cars? When they blow a tire and buy a new one, is that the dismembered limb of some other car, or is it like replacing a shoe? And if so, who made the tires? Who made the cameras that they filmed the races with? And what's the deal with... Anyway, number 11 is Toy Story, the one that started it all. Around each and every corner lurked a brand new fun character to discover. Sure, the animation appears crude now, especially whenever you see any humans, but the magic created by the story and the cast and the writers made its mark on our hearts regardless. Fun fact, the script for Toy Story was only the second cinematic writing credit for rookie screenwriter Joss Whedon. So there's yet another thing you can credit Toy Story with kickstarting. That man's career. Number 10 is Monsters, Inc. Very early in their history, these geniuses took the Monsters Under Our Beds concept and made it into a touching tale of friendship and a thinly veiled commentary on alternative fuel sources and the need to end our reliance on foreign oil. Don't see it? Look again. And don't worry, the movie, especially the wild chase finale, something that has become sort of a fixture at Pixar movies now, which takes place in a universe jumping door factory, will make it worth the time spent on a second look. Number nine is Toy Story 2, a miracle from Pixar's early days, which began as a direct-to-video sequel ordered by Disney that Pixar just threw out most of the way through production because it wasn't any good, and then completely overhauled during a frenzied nine-month period with employees working double or triple time to complete it into a moving, exciting, and completely entertaining blast that improved upon the original in every way. 
New themes, new things for our characters to learn, a great new villain, another high-stakes wild chase finale, and a subplot involving Jesse the cowgirl that... Damn you, Sarah McLaughlin! Ah, oh, it got everyone reaching for the tissues. Number eight is Ratatouille, a movie that should not have worked. I mean, the thought of rats making food is frankly disgusting, but when that rat is a foodie, voiced by the comic genius Patton Oswalt, you've got quite a cinematic feast. The film also boasts Peter O'Toole as Anton Ego, every snobby critic's avatar, uh, including mine. See the show notes for the clip of Anton Ego reading his review, the best part of a terrific movie all about the mindset of critics. It could be my mantra. This one takes chances with the storytelling, takes weird and whimsical flights of fancy, and best of all, it makes you want to go and enjoy some art, be it film, or wine, or cooking, and take the time to savor it. Number seven is Toy Story 3, which managed to inexplicably top the first inexplicable sequel. By spinning the movie off in a new direction, it proved that these toys could sustain a story without being confined to a child's bedroom, and contains a scene set at a trash incinerator, you know the one, that stands as one of the most effective, simple, and heartbreaking expressions of friendship, loyalty, and mortality that I can imagine, and Okay, cut, 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 cut! Don't look at me! <clears throat> all right, I'm back. In short, Toy Story 3 is all about saying goodbye, and it expresses this so beautifully in its final scene. And I didn't even mention the awesome heist escape film that's in there, and the comic brilliance of Michael Keaton as clothes horse Ken. That's how much stuff they crammed into this movie! Number six is up, and it contains maybe the best four minute sequence of any Pixar film, including the shorts. Michael Giacchino's Merry Life theme sends us on a whirlwind journey through a montage that tells a complex and completely devastating story about the eternal and doomed love of Carl and Ellie Fredrickson that has the entire theater in tears by the end of the first reel. This is the last of the Pixar films to really take huge structuring gambles, with one half being a two-person coming-of-age story and the second half being a fast-paced comedy adventure, complete with another zany action chase finale, but both halves are great, even if they don't exactly mesh together perfectly. Number five is Finding Dory, the sequel to Finding Nemo, which crafted a completely different film in structure and tone, but still deploys the laughs and the feels with clock-like precision. It contains yet another patented Pixar emotional gut punch moment, like most of the top ten here. You can watch my review of that film by clicking the link up there. Number four is WALL-E, and this is really the pinnacle of Pixar's risk-taking. A film in two separate halves, the first of which contains no real dialogue, and which takes place in the sort of burnt-out, dystopian, apocalyptic wasteland that had never really been in a movie for children before. Add to that its way out there science fiction second half, its apparent backbiting social commentary on corporate conglomerates, and its highly original character design, and this movie is one big risky swing for the fences, and it delivers on each one of those risks to create a surprising and original masterpiece. Again, it speaks to the brilliance of the Pixar brand that the movie I'm labeling as a masterpiece is coming in at only number four. Number three is The Incredibles, a film that was perfectly constructed fun and a comment on the value of being exceptional, something that director Brad Bird would explore his next time out on Ratatouille. Here we have a midlife crisis story wrapped up in a conventional superhero story with a healthy supply of heartwarming family values thrown into the mix. The Incredibles is breezy, fast-paced, imaginative, and very, very funny, with loads of great supporting characters like Edna Mode and Frozone, who provides one of my favorite exchanges of dialogue in any Pixar film. Honey! What? Where's my super suit? What? Where is my super suit? Uh Number two is Finding Nemo. This one film has everything that Pixar does best in perhaps the best iteration of each of those qualities. Unforgettable characters and lots of them. Beautiful imagery, emotional drive and catharsis, originality and gut-busting belly laughs. Finding Nemo is, simply put, a perfect film that gets me every time. And the best Pixar movie of all time is Inside Out. 
I have never filed an official review for Inside Out, but I did comment on it heavily in my Top 10 Films of 2015 list, and before that, on my Top 10 Movies of Summer 2015 list, where in both instances, it took the number one spot. Even now, one year on and several viewings of the Blu-ray later, I still have to tip my hat to the movie that left me shaken for days afterward the first time I saw it. Inside Out works on several levels as a teaching tool, as a visual metaphor, as an original and fascinating exploration of the human mind, as a coming of age story, and as a road trip buddy comedy. It's a miracle that this movie even exists. Not to mention that it was executed perfectly, full of surprises, emotional workouts, huge character driven laughs, and original ideas, Inside Out still stands as the best of the best. That does it for this edition of Movies That Pop. Don't forget to follow me, the Colonel, on Twitter, at Movies That Pop, and click the icon right down there to visit our channel. You'll be able to view all of our other videos, and more importantly, click subscribe while you're there, so you can keep up with all the latest episodes, and so we can keep doing what we do. Please leave your favorite Pixar movies in the comments below, and click the thumbs up if you like what you heard. In the meantime, thanks for watching, I'm the Colonel, and 